Welcome everyone. My name is Marcy Marr and I'm the Stewardship Coordinator for the Kootenai Conservation Program, known as KCP. And I'll be your host today. And thank you for joining us for this special webinar to go on a virtual tour of conservation projects funded by the Columbia Valley and Kootenai Lake Local Conservation Funds. As many of you know, this time of year, KCP typically hosts spring field tours in which we travel the various sites in the Kootenays to showcase best practices in land and water stewardship and share information in a way that encourages peer learning among practitioners. By now, most of you know, uh, and, you're, and you're probably pros at Zoom technology, but if you need technical assistance, please use the chat box uh, found on your toolbar and Nicole Trigg, our communications coordinator, will help you. And uh, if at any time during any of the presentations you've got questions, um, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll have time for Q&A at the end of the presentations. Given the rich heritage of stewardship in our region, I would like to acknowledge that KCP's work occurs in the traditional territories of the Tunaha, Shwepmek, the Sinaiks, and the Silks peoples, who've lived here and stewarded the land and water for many generations. And while some people are still joining us and settling in, um, I'd like to tell you a bit about the Kootenai Conservation Program. We're a broad, broad partnership founded in 2002 that is comprised of over 80 land and water conservation and stewardship groups, government agencies, resource industries, and agricultural producer, producers in this region. And our mandate is to coordinate and facilitate conservation efforts on private land and to generate the support and resources needed to maintain these efforts. And championing and administrating local conservation funds is one important way that KCP generates support and resources for local conservation priorities. And so today we're gonna to be featuring five projects out of nearly 100 that have received financial support from our two uh, local conservation funds in the Kootenays. And we've chosen these five because they represent a diverse cross-section of the type of projects funded by local conservation funds. And as of yet, um, KCP has not featured them in webinars or other communications, so this is a great occasion to debut them. And for a full list of funded projects, please visit kootenayconservation.ca and you'll find out everything you wanna know about local conservation funds here in the Kootenays. So for those wondering now, you know, what exactly are local conservation funds? Um, I'd like to take a few minutes just to explain um, th what these funds are. So a local conservation fund is a local government service. Uh, it's a dedicated tax and it's used to support local conservation projects for water, wildlife, habitat, open space, uh, and ecosystem services important to local communities. And the two local conservation funds we have in the Kootenays, um, one is managed by the Regional District of East Kootenay and one by the Regional District of Central Kootenay. And uh, they're administered by KCP on behalf of the regional districts and the funds are distributed annually. And each of the local conservation funds has its own technical review committee. And these committees evaluate and recommend projects that meet the criteria that are part of the ter terms of reference for each of the funds. But ultimately, the, the decision rests with uh, elected officials who decide which projects receive funding and how much uh, will be given out in any given year. One important value of these local conservation funds is that for every dollar raised locally by this dedicated tax, local conservation funds leverage at least two to one, and in some cases up to nine to one, in terms of matched additional dollars um, that are supporting our local communities. So a little bit more about these two funds. The Columbia Valley Fund was established in 2008. It's the first one of its kind in Canada. It's, it's, it was the only one, and it is, um, at this point, still a very, very innovative tool for local financing. It covers the Columbia Valley subregion of the um, Regional District of East Kootenay from Canal Flats to Spill and Machine. And residents there pay a $20 parcel tax per year that contributes to this fund. 
Thus far, $1.9 million have been invested, leveraging over $17 million in partner dollars. And this year, the cohort of projects, we've got eight of them, um, is worth over $110,000, um, as well as there's been a substantial contribution to um, land acquisition. Over in the West Kootenai, at Kootenai Lake, um, the Kootenai Lake Local Conservation Fund was established in 2014 and covers the RDCK electoral areas of A, D, and E around Kootenai Lake. And the residents there pay $15 parcel tax. And um, over the life of this um, fund, we've gotten 298,000 invested, leveraging over 550,000 in partner dollars. And for this year, we have seven projects that are supported um, by $75,000 worth of fund. And I want to take a, a moment here just to acknowledge the elected officials whose vision and leadership and uh, an innovative spirit has, has made this service possible, uh, as well as the technical review committee members um, whose knowledge and expertise have been critical to this process as well. And this innovative type of locally generated funding has inspired other places. And so I just wanna make sure you all know that um, the regional district of Okanagan's um, Smilkameen established a fund in 2016. And then just last year, the regional district of North Okanagan um, established a fund as well. So um, this innovative uh, tool keeps spreading. So now I'd like to, um, begin our, our tour, and I hope everybody has a water bottle and is in a comfy chair. And um, we're gonna start in the, in the West Kootenai with the North Kootenai Lake Water Monitoring Program and Greg Yutzik, um, who will be speaking on behalf of the um, work he's done with the Kootenai Center for Forestry Alternatives. And then we'll move to Brenda um, Urbison's um, talk about beavers along the Lardo and Duncan River floodplains and on to knotweed removal on private lands that Aaron Bates from the Central Kootenai Invasive Species Society tell us about. And then over to the East Kootenai um, with Luxor linkage and forest um, restoration that uh, the Nature Conservancy is doing there. Um, Kate McKenzie will speak to that project. And um, then a bit south to uh, the Columbia Lake and their Columbia Lake ecosystem and monitoring, monitoring and education um, project that Nancy Wilson will speak to. So I'd like to turn it over now to Greg, um, who's a conservation ecologist and land use planning consultant with Kootenai Center for Forestry Alternatives. As Marcy said, I'm Greg Utzig. I'm today representing the Kootenai Center for Forestry Alternatives and describing a project that's been received some funding from the local conservation fund for the past three years, and that's the uh, North Kootenai Lake Water Monitoring Project. Um, the water Watershed monitoring project, of course, is focused on under, better understanding of smaller watersheds in the area. We actually have three different types of monitoring we're doing. We're doing stream flow and we're doing uh, snow monitoring through a couple of snow courses. And we also have uh, three climate stations where we're monitoring uh, temperature and precipitation. And as well as stream flow, we're also looking at water temperature. Um, as you can see from the map in the center, our stuff is our sites are concentrated in the uh, North End of Kootenai Lake, but in fact, it represents an area much broader extending over into the Slocan and into the uh, Arrow Reservoir area, because those areas all have similar climates to the area this, that we're monitoring. Um, specifically, the project includes seven different creeks, uh, two on the east side of the lake in Johnson's Landing, one, uh, Kootenai Joe Creek and the other one, uh, Gar Creek, where the uh, um, Johnson's Landing landslide occurred back in 2012. And as well, we're doing Davis Creek, which uh, um, drains into the uh, fan on which Lardo is, is situated. And our two snow courses, one is Lost Ledge, which is uh, just south of the Davis Creek area. And the other one is at the top end of Kootenai Joe Creek on the east side. And we have a climate stations in each of those snow courses, as well as a lower elevation one in Johnson's Landing. The other uh, streams we're monitoring are just south of there near Caslow, North Caslow, the um, McDonald Creek and Bjorkness Creek, which is just south of Caslow. 
and as well as two uh, high elevation sub drainages off of Keene Creek, the Upper Carlisle Creek and Upper Ben Hur Creek. Um, and the idea is that each of these are small watersheds, but there's a bit of variation in terms of size, but also variation in terms of topography and uh, the type of environment they're representing. And the larger ones that drain into the Kazo River, of course, are important for fisheries, Kazo River being an important spawning area for, um, for trout. Um, why are we doing this? Uh, climate change is probably the main reason. Um, you notice in the graph in the upper left, that uh, over the 20th century, the June temperatures centered around 15 degrees. And you'll notice in 2015, we actually had the month of June average 20 degrees. Things are changing quite rapidly. And of course, this is gonna have an impact on, on watershed management. As well, precipitation is changing. You'll notice in the graph on the lower right, in 2013, we experienced extreme precipitation, which occurred here in the West Kootenai, but also affected the East Kootenai. Um, this was an example of an extreme event. Um, we had 100 and up to 125 or 130 millimeters of precip in a three-day period. Um, the Elk River and Buell Creek were affected in the East Kootenai and the West Kootenai, Fry Creek, Shoulder Creek, Lower Hamel Creek. were all affected here in the area that we're monitoring. Um, and these in Upper Hamel Creek combined with a recent fire, which is also fire is another impact which we're getting out of climate change these days. Um, there's also these small creeks can create uh, serious issues in terms of public safety. This was a, 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 a mapping of uh, a fire that occurred in Springer Creek in the Slocan Valley and that resulted with a high precipitation event of a number of uh, debris flows, which blocked the highway. And in fact, one person was killed when they were checking out their water license. Um, of course, for the conservation program, we're also very much interested in aquatic habitats and the impact of climate change on fisheries habitats, um, particularly where temperature is an issue because of increasing temperature affecting uh, our trout and salmonids, kokanee in the area. And climate change has lots of other impacts on fisheries habitat as well, which are the kinds of things that we're trying to get more data to understand what's changing and what we might be able to do from a management perspective to try and improve those habitats as climate change rolls out. Um, the other reason we're doing this is the provincial government and the federal government have backed away from managing small streams. All the yellow dots on the map within our area of influence were areas that were active hydrometric stations over the previous decades. And the only ones that remain active today are the six red ones. And none of those are on small streams. As you can see in our area of influence, at one time back in the 1950s, there was somewhere around 20 different small streams that were being monitored and as of the year 2000, none of them are being monitored. And so we're trying to pick up some of that monitoring. Um, small streams are also important uh, because people draw their water from them. Um, these are, the map on the left shows all the water licenses in some of the small streams in our monitoring area. Um, you can see that Lardo is built on the fan of one of the streams that we're monitoring and uh, Cuscanook um, experienced a, uh, in 2004, a debris fl flood, which uh, severely impacted that community. So what do we have? We have these series of seven monitoring sites and a lot of our work is done with volunteers. What the, the funding from the Kootenai Conservation Fund allows us to do is to hire a professional hydrologist on contract and a project coordinator to coordinate our volunteers to do work on these various sites. Um, and having the professional hydrologist is necessary to make sure that our measurements are compatible with provincial and federal databases so that they do meet standards that are necessary. Um, we also have our climate stations which uh, need to be maintained and the data downloaded from those a couple times a year. And the snow courses, we have people that go out on a monthly basis to measure snow depth and the water content of snow. And again, we use uh, volunteers almost exclusively for doing that work. 
And lastly, what are the community benefits? What is the point of doing this? Well, the idea is to provide this data on small streams and the data is used for aquatic ecosystem management, understanding what effects are likely to be happening on fisheries and riparian zones. We're looking at water resource planning to make sure that people can maintain their water rights for irrigation or domestic use, and also emergency planning around uh, the potential for floods and debris flows. And lastly, because of our volunteer and education um, work and uh, presentations like this one today. We do a fair bit of community outreach and uh, the idea is to uh, educate people more about streams and their importance and to ensure that our management actually meets our needs. So um, we receive funding from a broad range. I know Marcy talked about the way this money can be leveraged and that's what we've done. We've used it to gain funding from various other sources. And of course, our contractors and volunteers are a really important part of the project. And that's it. Thanks so much, Greg. Great presentation. Um, now we'll just uh, move into the world of beavers uh, along the Lardo and Duncan uh, River floodplains with Brenda Herbison, who's a consultant, who's an independent biologist and uh, is with the BC Conservation Foundation. So today I'll be talking about a project that really hasn't started yet, so it's going to be short and lots of pictures. Um, but I can tell you a bit about what I'm planning to do and some of the reasons for it. The beaver and habitat surveys along the rivers are just a first step towards determining whether in fact there has been a population drop, which there certainly appears to have been by everyone's impressions and for determining actions for restoring beavers and habitat if necessary. So the project area is this, it's the lower, well actually the whole Lardo River up to Girard and the lower Duncan floodplain. And part of this area, the part that's shown in this map, I surveyed in 210 for beaver colonies as part of a research project I was doing on beavers and cottonwoods. So the good part about this proposal is that we'll have that database to compare to. And in the additional area that we're adding in this project is the north of here to Girard. So why beavers, you might say? Well, they're unremarkable animals with remarkable abilities. They're the only animals other than humans that can alter their surroundings so profoundly and so efficiently. They're expert engineers of ponds and wetlands, and they send no invoices. And I'll add that they work in areas where machines would be impossibly damaging. And these are the, the zones where it is needed the most. Their flooding reconnects floodplains and recharges stream beds. The accumulated nutrients and sediments heal degraded channels, enriching habitat. And maybe most of you know that channels downstream from regulated, well, on regulated rivers downstream from dams typically degrade. So this service is particularly important on parts of the Duncan. Their dams moderate climate-driven stream changes such as what Greg was talking about, holding back extreme flows and raising summer and fall base flows. The photo on the right is a particularly remarkable example of that, I find. It was along the Lardo River in the late fall, and that pool on the side channel was at least a meter higher than the main river here, completely held back. There are keystone species upon which many others depend. Now, a lot of these pictures are from the internet and I'll acknowledge that at the end, but they are all species that live here and use beaver ponds. And of course, this is a very small percentage of them. They depend on the habitat that beavers create in large part. So why are surveys important? Well, as I said, to confirm or refute the apparent low current population. And in 210, there were 10 
colonies along the Lotto and 13 along the Duncan. And I'll add here that the survey method, which I'll explain later, only inventories colonies, not actual individuals. But we'll talk about that later. The other purpose is to assess the habitat to help determine is it habitat that's explaining the decline or is it some other factor? And also to determine the potential for reintroduction and restoration, habitat restoration and beaver reintroduction if the habitat's fine. So what's planned? Well, Local conversations, lots of them, because I found that the trapper records have not been useful at all for beaver inventory for various reasons so far. And so there's a lot I think that people know that is not out there in the public domain. So I'll be talking to people and also getting their concerns about beaver problems. And prior to field work, I'll do a river scale habitat suitability assessment with all available ortho photos and LIDAR imagery and, and all the literature. There are various beaver habitat models around. And then in the late summer and fall, the plan is to search for food caches along suitable channels because all northern beavers build food caches in, to survive the winter and it's actually a very reliable way of inventorying colonies. Now along rivers, beavers don't build freestanding lodges very frequently, so aerial methods such as helicopter or drones are not as useful for inventorying beavers in these settings. And of course, I'll summarize and analyze at the end. Now, the next few slides really just show examples of the extensive beaver works that I found in 210 along both floodplains. And I was surprised, I was really surprised at how extensive they were. This and the next three slides show a channel that beavers deepened. It was a natural flood channel, but they deepened it to provide water all winter in from the main river. The main river is out this way, and um, I'll show you that it goes through, and, and they built a large stick and bank lodge further up the channel. And here's a little pond that they held back up there. And canals were one of the most amazing things that I found in low-lying fine sediments, especially on the Duncan Delta. They dug extensive canals, quite independent from any channels that we carry water inland. Here's some pictures of the canals. And these canals created pools within the center of the shrub and forest complexes that you really have no idea were even there half the time. Beautiful pools. And even after abandonment, those pools contributed to habitat diversity, forming meadows, here's a sedge meadow that was a pool such as that at one time. You can see the old canals coming into it. And this is, as I said before, this is in very low-lying areas where machines simply couldn't work, even, even if the cost could be covered by the extensive artificial wetland creation work. Just about all the side channels were dammed to some extent. more side channel downs. And these would all created little wetlands as well, some of them quite deep and high up into the floodplain, that, such as this one on the left. They were all little wetlands hidden away up the side channels. And along the Lardo, the Duncan River, sorry, a lot of the side channel downs would get wiped out in the high flows from the dam release in the fall. This is not a very good picture of hydrographs, but I, I can show, I don't know if you see my arrow, but on the one on the right, you can see that the fall and winter flows come up higher than the summer flows. And typically those just took the dams out, usually along the Duncan. But as you could see in that earlier photo along the Lotto, they, they stayed quite nicely through the fall and the winter, the dams. 
when I was meant to say that even though the Duncan did take out the dams below the beaver dams below the Duncan Dam, I don't know if you can see this, but you probably can't. But there was an amazing, long-lasting effect in the sort of center right top of this slide. There's a little slide, little distributary that had a dam across it. And for roughly eight years after that, even though the dam was taken up, out, the sediment continued to build behind there. And it completely changed that little complex. So that was interesting. Even though the force of the river is so strong, the beavers still had an impact on channel morphology. And as I said before, along the Lardo River, as the summer and fall flows dropped, the beavers held, them, held the flow back quite successfully, quite amazingly successfully. And you can imagine all the other wildlife that this benefits, as well as, of course, humans downstream. You saw this before. So that's actually the end of my talk. It may be a little short, but I'd like to acknowledge the BC Conservation Fund, who's my sponsor, and the Columbia Basin Fish and Wildlife Comp Program, who are um, contributing to this as well, and of course the Kootenai Lake Local Conservation Fund. And without this support, this project simply wouldn't happen, even though it's fun to survey beavers. It, you know, it's, it takes time, and it's going to be some hard work going along those channels. And, a little bit of risk involved, so thank you very much, and maybe I'll have lots of time for questions later. Great, thanks, Brenda. Yeah, um, we'll uh, take questions at the end of all the presentations, but if you have any um, for Brenda, please put them in the question and answer box. And so we'll move on now to uh, Aaron Bates, who is the Executive Director of the Central Kootenai Invasive Species Society, and she's going to talk to us about um, Napweed removal on private lands. So over to you, Erin. Great, thanks, Marcy. And welcome, everybody, and thanks so much to Kootenai Conservation Program for um, asking me to join this webinar. Um, yeah, so our project for the Kootenai Lake Local Conservation Fund is very new this year, and I'm just going to start with a brief introduction to um, our organization and myself as well. So um, as Marcy mentioned, my name is Erin Bates. I'm the um, Central Kootenai Invasive Species Society's Executive Director. I've been in this position for a little over a year now. Um, so we were founded in 2005. Um, we currently have about 258 members. And um, basically, we our, our mission is to protect ecosystems and communities in the Central Kootenai region by preventing and reducing the harmful impacts of invasive species. So we've been doing that for 15 years now. Very exciting. Um, as you can see by this map, um, our operational area is all of the RDCK plus a little bit of the RDKB. So uh, we certainly encompass the, the Kootenai Lake Local Conservation Area. So a little overview of this project. Um, Knotweeds are um, by far the highest priority invasive plant in British Columbia. Um, and a lot of money and effort goes into managing um, the various species of knotweeds throughout our province every year between various provincial and regional, as well as municipal government um, funds and efforts and various little projects like this. Um, and unfortunately for us, the Kootenai Lake area has a significant amount of knotweed. Um, there are a lot of current, current management efforts going on, as I mentioned, but none of them, at least in our region, currently include private land. So you can see on this map here, I've tried to show the areas that are included in the Kootenai Lake Local Conservation Project area. So areas A, E, and D of the RDCK. And all the brown dots are knotweed sites that we know to be on private land. Um, and then the other colored dots are various jurisdictions that most of which are being managed to some extent or another. So you can see that actually the majority of knotweed that we see and deal with in our region is on private land. And so that's a huge gap in knotweed management for our region is to not be able to manage those at all. 
Um, so, you know, knotweed management is pretty difficult and it can be quite expensive. And lots of landowners find that they're not able to overcome those barriers on their own. So the point of this project is to provide a, a cost sharing and expertise sharing arrangement for private knotweed treatment. Um, so we're gonna support private landowners to protect um, native habitat and keep their property safe, as well as fulfilling their legal responsibilities by controlling knotweed on their land. So I'm just gonna take a couple steps back here and give you guys a little bit of an overview of why we care about knotweed, um, why it's considered invasive. Um, globally, Japanese knotweed is listed um, by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature as one of the 100 worst invasive alien species worldwide. So some of the impacts that it has um, in when it's invading new habitat is, um, the main one is displacing native vegetation. So basically it creates these dense monoculture stems. Um, and knotweed also has an, an odd um, feature where it suppresses other plant growth where, it, where it's inhabiting the soil by releasing biochemicals. So it's a, something called allelopathy, but basically it's just suppressing other plants from growing and enabling itself to take over in a monoculture. Um, so when it creates these stands, it reduces the amount and quality of habitat for um, the various native um, flora and fauna, and it also creates barriers to animal movement through the environment. Um, knotweed has a vigorous rhizome system that can also cause shoreline erosion when it dies back in the winter and leaves exposed soils. And generally, overall, um, studies have shown that knotweed, the presence of knotweed in an ecosystem dramatically reduces species diversity. So those are some of the environmental impacts. And the interesting thing about knotweed is that it has impacts over and above the environmental impacts that um, create, create a lot of concern in and of themselves. So some of these other impacts include um, infrastructure damage. So this rhizome structure that I mentioned is incredibly vigorous and can grow through concrete and pipeline type infrastructure. So it damages foundations, roadway surfaces, water infrastructure. I've got a couple little photos over here of literally knotweed growing through asphalt and the edges of roadsides. Um, knotweed can also impact property values. So in some highly impacted areas, for instance, Great Britain, properties that have knotweed infestations are actually difficult to sell and so they have a lower value on the market and they're also more difficult to get insurance for. It sounds crazy but it's very real. <laughs> um, and then in BC there's also a legal risk of having knotweed on your property because if you um, are not controlling it and you're allowing knotweed to spread onto adjacent crown lands, um, you could actually be at risk of being charged by a conservation officer. So yeah, knotweed has some various fairly significant impacts and cumulatively it leads to them being an extremely high species or high priority species. So generally for knotweeds, um, the reproduction and spread is mainly by um, vegetative fragmentation. So it has this vigorous large rhizome structure that can extend up to three meters deep and 20 meters wide underneath the ground. So it's way bigger than what you see above ground. And that can be pretty significant as you probably have seen. So that rhizome structure can store energy and actually regrow for many years, even if somehow you manage to not let the top growth show up, um, it'll, it'll just pop right back up if you stop actively managing it, at least in a manual sense. And then, Unfortunately, disturbing the top growth, so cutting, that kind of thing, can stimulate the rhizome to spread. Um, so it's definitely, you can see it on sites that have been mowed, it tends to want to spread a little bit further away. Um, and that's, that reproduction is extremely easy to happen. Um, so it can reproduce from stem and rhizome fragments as small as 0.7 grams. Super tiny, it could be just in a clod of dirt on your boot or on a truck tire and it'll just get moved down the road and it could start a new patch. So obviously it's quite easy to spread, um, usually completely by accident, just by dumping 
garden waste or mowing it, um, just accidental soil movement, improper disposal of garden waste, and um, like I said, contaminated equipment as well. So my little photo here is an example of Ministry of Transportation efforts to prevent knotweed spread. So they ins we install these signs for the ministry in front of knotweed patches so that their highway mowers don't come along and mow the knotweed and thereby spread it down the highway. So as I mentioned briefly, um, knotweed has some very significant management challenges. Um, essentially, after a lot of research and trial and error, basically for large established sites, manual remover, move, <laughs> excuse me, manual removal efforts like digging and cutting are generally unsuccessful and usually result in increased spread. So as a general practice, that type of management is not recommended for knotweed. And that includes things like smothering, mulching, it just as soon as you stop those efforts, uh, the rhizome will pop right back up. So according to current research, the only recommended management options for knotweed are number one, and this is, goes for every invasive species ever, would be prevention. So it's cheap, um, it's relatively easy, but it does require a, a high level of public awareness and, and engagement. Number two, if you already have an established knotweed patch, um, probably the most sort of cost effective and generally overall effective method has been found to be a systemic herd of herbicide application, which tends to, um, it doesn't disturb the site very much, so it doesn't just sort of stimulate that rhizome to spread and, and grow. And the cost overall is moderate compared with other options. And then the third somewhat recommended option is um, a full excavation, but um, you have to follow a, a fairly significant set of best management practices with a lot of precautions, proper disposal of a large volume of contaminated soil, cleaning equipment. It tends to be really high cost and disturbs the site very significantly and has a pretty high risk of um, contributing to the spread just by accidental soil, contaminated soil movement. So as you can see, this creates some barriers for um, private landowners to manage her or manage knotweed on their properties. Um, so hiring a professional herbicide applicator can be quite expensive. Um, and generally, we've found that members of the public don't have a lot of knowledge or understanding about various herbicides, um, information, and risks, regulations surrounding that type of thing. So it seemed to us like a good opportunity to provide support um, in that area. So the project activities that we're undertaking for this Kootenai Lake Local Conservation Fund project um, include, we're gonna be conducting outreach to landowners where we know there are existing knotweed infestations and we'll do a bit of advertising in order to hopefully reach other landowners that we don't even know about because there's probably a lot we know there's inventory gaps. Um, we'll conduct site assessments for interested landowners to determine if they're eligible, um, if the site is able to be treated and develop a safe treatment plan and give them an estimate of the cost of treatment and then we'll coordinate the actual treatment and um, the program will subsidize the cost of that treatment up to 50%. And then the landowners you know, will sign some agreement and, and get that all set up. And then once the treatment's complete, we'll also be doing monitoring to make sure that they were effective and that all the legal regulation, regulations are followed and that sort of thing. So basically this funding is going to allow CKIS to fill a major gap in regional knotweed management and we'll be assisting private landowners to manage knotweed for the first time in RDC, in, in the RDCK. General community benefits that we're hoping to see from eradicating knotweed um, would include protection of native habitat and protecting our diverse native plant communities. Um, we'll hopefully be preventing shoreline erosion and preventing knotweed from spreading into sensitive riparian habitats. Additionally, we'll prevent um, some costly damage to property as well as road infrastructure, which hopefully will keep our taxes down on a provincial scale. Um, and, and we'll be maintaining property values and preventing our regional infestation from becoming a major concern. 
And finally, we're very much hoping that this, this project will lead to increased public awareness and which hopefully will lead to additional prevention of knotweed impacts in the future. So thanks so much um, to Kootenai Conservation Program for organizing this webinar and for coordinating the Conservation Fund. And all of this work could not happen without supporting funders and partners, including the Columbia Basin Trust, uh, the Regional District of Central Kootenai, as well as uh, the province of BC. There's a, a number of different ministries involved with knotweed management and supporting invasive species management in our province. So thanks very much, and I will look forward to questions at the end. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, we are now gonna move over to the East Kootenai, uh, just north of Edgewater, and hear from Kate McKenzie, who's the Stewardship Coordinator for the Canadian Rocky Mountain Region of the Nature Conservancy of Canada. And she's going to talk to us about an amazing natural landscape that we all affectionately call the Luxor Linkage. So over to you, Kate. All right, thanks for that, Marcy. Um, right, so thanks for having me today. Like Marcy said, my name is Kate McKenzie. I'm the Stewardship Coordinator for the Rocky Mountain Program Area for the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Um, I'm going to talk today about our Luxor Linkage Forest Resiliency and Restoration Project. Uh, so just a little background on the Nature Conservancy of Canada. NCC is a nonprofit land trust, and we work across Canada to protect important habitat for conservation, and we manage those lands for the long term. So just for some context, the Luxor linkage property is located in the Columbia Valley, um, and it was acquired in fee simple by NCC in two, 2016. Um, on the map here, it's the property is highlighted in red, so about 15 minutes north from Radium, and it's surrounded by both private land and other protected areas uh, like the Kootenai National Park. There are several conservation values on the property that made it a high priority for us to protect. Um, number one, it lies in a high capability grizzly linkage zone, so it helps connect core grizzly bear habitat in both the Rocky Mountains and the Purcells, um, and also provides movement corridors for other wildlife. Um, the dry open forest ecosystems on the property also provide critical habitat for species at risk, like American badger and common nighthawk. Um, and finally, the property also protects a portion of the Columbia Valley wetlands. So ultimately, these values serve as the why we started this project, and in particular, we wanted to address the need to improve the quality and function of the grassland and open forest ecosystems. So often when we talk about improving condition, we are really talking about mitigating threats to those ecosystems. In the case of Luxor, the primary threat um, is the long history of fire suppression that has caused forest ingrowth, um, as well as encroachment of trees on grasslands. So just as a bit of history, interior Douglas fir ecosystems in the Rocky Mountain Trench used to be maintained by frequent low intensity fires, uh, but fire suppression over the last century or so has allowed for a higher density of trees to grow on the landscape. Um, so this becomes a problem because the trees crowd out um, the native grasses in the understory, and ultimately that reduces forage um, that would be otherwise available for ungulates like elk and bighorn sheep. Um, Ingrowth also increases the risk that low intensity grass fires um, that are natural on the landscape will actually jump into the canopy and become high intensity crown fires. So these pictures here on this slide show what most of the forest looks like on Luxor at the moment. So you can see that there's a lot of crowding going on uh, with small conifers growing in the open areas. So the overall vid vision for the pro project is to improve habitat for wildlife and restore critical habitat for species at risk, uh, while also safeguarding local communities from the threat of wildfire. So we're actually heading into the third year of this project. So the goal for this year is to restore between 10 and 20 hectares and transition closed forests to a more, more open forest condition. Uh, this will build on the 36 hectares that we've already done since 2017. And 
Generally, we're aiming to decrease the stem density in these areas to around 400 stems per hectare on average. Um, so that will open up the canopy and allow for understory grasses to thrive. So we always start out these projects uh, by developing a vegetation management plan that will outline our long-term goals and guide our overall activities on the whole property. Um, so from, from that plan, we get a map that sort of looks like this one. Um, and essentially everything that is on the property outlined in green are areas that have been identified as needing some kind of ecosystem restoration treatment. And these areas circled um, are where we've already started working and it's likely where we're going to continue our work this year. So the next step is to hire a registered forester to write us a stand management prescription to guide the annual forest thinning treatments. Essentially, we get something that looks sort of like this. Um, it's just an example of the type of data that we get in a prescription. So it basically outlines what the stand conditions currently are based on a series of plots that are established. Um, and it outlines what trees need to be removed in order to meet our objectives. Um, so we also get a map like that one on the right outlining the treatment unit boundaries that we'll take on in a given year. So once the prescription is prepared and the budget is in place, then we start hiring forestry contractors to actually complete the slashing work. Um, so they'll complete the work based on what has been outlined in the prescription. So generally that involves targeting young Douglas fir and logical pine for removal. Um, and we also retain, make sure to retain all deciduous species on the landscape like aspen and larch. Um, so these are just some images following uh, previous slashing treatments. So depending on the volume of slash material that is produced, we'll either pile, pile and burn the leftovers like in the top two photos there, um, or we scatter it on site like the photo in the bottom left. We also do quality checks throughout the project to ensure that the prescription is being followed. Um, so the bottom right photo is just an example of something we check for. Um, and so that's showing really high quality work where trees have been cut as low to the ground as possible. And finally, for every restoration project, we always do monitoring work to see if we achieved our goals successfully. So for this, we use a lot of photos um, to monitor our success because a lot of the changes are quite visually dramatic. So this one shows what much of the property looked like on average um, before restoration work. And here is one of a post restoration area after one full growing season. And this is just another example of how much more open the canopy becomes following restoration and how much more light can get all the way to the ground. And we also re-monitor the plots that we established at the beginning um, in order to collect more stand structure data. Um, and that allows us to make comparisons with what was there before. And so this tells us whether we achieved our desired stem density or not. So many of the conservation benefits for this project I've sort of touched on already. Um, we're mainly trying to improve habitat for wildlife. But there are also a few community benefits as well that come from a project like this. So for instance, attracting more wildlife means that there's more opportunities for nature appreciation. And just like in that bottom right photo, that I got that from the property just last week. And so you can see that it's in full bloom with wildflowers enjoying that sunshine. And so I definitely recommend that if you want to visit that you go out pretty soon. Um, but I would say one of the main benefits to communities really is the lowered risk of the, that local high intensity crown fire. Um, because over time, as we do more restoration work, it, this will create sort of a, a landscape scale fire break. Um, and so all of these pictures were taken on the property, but I wanted to point out the one in the middle specifically. It's a, a photo of a common nighthawk that I took last week. Um, it's really poor quality because I took it through my binoculars, but it was really exciting because that's one of the species that we're hoping to attract um, with this type of restoration project. So it's very satisfying to see them using habitat that we created. 
So just a little bit about funding. Over the past couple of years, we've received funding from the Columbia Valley Local Conservation Fund for this project, as well as for other projects in the Valley. Um, this funding has been really important for us for completing this work, mainly because it's been a consistent form of funding, uh, which is very helpful for multi-year projects. Um, we generally use this funding for prescription development, as well as the forestry contractors. Um, and also the local conservation fund really anchors our work in the Columbia Valley and it allows us to um, bring in matching funds from elsewhere that can sometimes double or triple our conservation impact. Um, so just, I've just listed there a couple of the other funders that have been instrumental in helping us do these projects. So the next steps for us is basically keep raising money and keep chipping away at more of those restoration projects. You'll remember the map with all those green areas. We have a lot of work to do still. Um, so over the next few years, we'll, we'll try and get some volunteers involved in the restoration work as well. Um, so if you're interested, you can keep an eye on our website and look for future conservation volunteer events. Um, we'll also keep monitoring our progress as we go. And of course, Hopefully, looking forward to the future, we're, we're hopeful for a day when we can safely apply prescribed fire as a management tool. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so um, we have Nancy Wilson. She is a retired geologist and she is board chair of the Columbia Lake Stewardship Society. As uh, Marcy said, I'm the chair of the Columbia Lake Stewardship Society and I'm going to talk today about our ecosystem monitoring and education program. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about Columbia Lake, who we are, what we do, and then about some of our programs, and then finish off by just thanking Columbia Valley Local Conservation Fund and talking about how important they are to what we do. Uh, this pic is a picture of Columbia Lake. Um, our vision for the lake is to predict the near pristine nature of Columbia Lake for present and future generations. Um, it's not hard to see why we would like to do that because it's an absolutely beautiful lake which is uh, not very developed. Um, and what we'd like to do is be able to pass it on to future generations in much the same shape it is, it, it is now. And we call it, CLFS does that by being a citizen-based um, uh, ad, ad group for the lake. Uh, before I go on, I'll just talk about uh, who CLFS is. Uh, we are a science-based organization. We are very fortunate that we had scientists that were available to begin when the organization started and to this day to help us set up our programs. Um, and that has uh, allowed us to set up programs you know, based on um, scientific protocols, et cetera. Um, we use a lot of citizens that do a whole bunch of things for us, um, including citizen science, and that's very important to us. Uh, we have volunteers from all around the lake and all the lakeside communities, uh, are both permanent residents that live around the lake all the time and second home residents that come here when they can, when they want to enjoy the lake. Last year, for the first time, we counted volunteer hours and we had over 2,200 hours contributed to CLFS by volunteers. We've also been fortunate to have summer students for four years and we've had a um, little bit of extra money and have hired some contract employees to help us. These are just some pictures of um, people working for CLFS, everything from being out in, in horrible weather and collecting data to sharing information to leading um, groups to go around and do weed pulls and lakeshore cleanups. What I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about our program, but to be very clear, I'm just going to really touch lightly on them. And if you want more information, you can contact me by email or our um, website that's listed there. Our programs include lake monitoring, and we monitor for lake water quality and quantity. We also do a lot of education work, um, outreach and advocacy, and of course, we try to communicate our message as much as possible. We started monitoring the lake in 2014, and here's a picture of uh, the top of Tom Dance, who is a retired hydrogeologist, and he set up our lake uh, water quality monitoring program. And then below that is Bill Thompson, who is a retired hydrometeorologist, and he has set up our water quantity program. Now, why do we monitor, and particularly for so much about water? Well, we monitor because we want to understand uh, potential threats to the lake. We want to understand what the water quality and quantity is now. So if things start to change, we can recognize that a change is happening. This data is available to decision makers. It means that they can know what the state of the lake was like from 2014 to 2040 to 2020. And then if anything changes, they will give them that information. This will help us provide guidance to determining the appropriate measures to maintain the health of the lake and heaven forbid repair the health, health of the lake, although that's not necessarily necessary now. 
Uh, water quality is the first thing I'll talk about. And in the upper right, there's a photo, an aerial photo of uh, Columbia Lake. And on the inside, it actually has the uh, watershed where the water for Columbia Lake comes from. This shows the four sites that we monitor year after year. And it starts off at uh, uh, Columbia Park at the north end of the lake and goes right down to almost to Canal Flats in the, with, as far in as we can get safely with a boat. Uh, we monitor bi-weekly for selected water sample uh, for water quality indicator parameters and monthly, so every time, every second time we monitor um, the bi-weekly program. We also collect samples for chemical analyses. We've also done a survey of chloride, turbidity, and conductivity concentrations at 14 locations throughout the lake, which to give us more details. We've also started measuring water quality on selected small streams, and that's going to give us some more local information. This, there's a picture there of a couple of citizen scientists going out and actually in the winter drilling a hole so that we could take a water quality sample in the winter and then taking the temperature of the lake on a beautiful summer's day. What have we found out from our water quality program? Well, today we found out that the water quality of Columbia Lake is actually very good. It's more than acceptable for recreational, recreational potable water and aquatic habitat use. This is again a picture of some citizen scientists out on the lake collecting a water sample for us. Um, we've also established a database, and with over five years of data, we've been able to establish um, a data range. We know what the, quote, normal is for the lake at this point, and that can help us to notice if there's any changes. Uh, we have noticed some small variations on a few parameters, uh, chloride, pH, and conductivity and turbidity being uh, the ones we've noticed variations in. And there's been variations in along the lake as well as through time. I have to emphasize that these changes are very small and they are not of significance in terms of being outside any acceptable ranges. But they're just things that we're watching. We're going to see if they increase or decrease or if we can understand what has caused these changes. We've also noticed when we started monitoring the streams that there are some local little variations. Again, very small, but it's just giving us a better and better understanding of what's happening with the water quality of the lake. Moving on to water quantity, um, this is a wonderful picture of Bill Thompson uh, out. He will go out in all sorts of weathers and, uh, and he does a great job of maintaining all our equipment and as he's doing some work on a, a lake level uh, gauge there. We have monitoring stations and we're able to uh, monitor the amount of water entering and leaving the lake and if the lake level changes, we monitor the water level, we monitor temperature, wind and precipitation. We also have a weather station which helps us measure rainfall and estimate snow runoff. And again, we've started to monitor creeks. We know that from a water quantity point of view, the creeks will not add a lot, but they'll just help. It's good to know what the quantity is at the various places and then it links in with the water quality. Uh, the key findings to date are that the annual rise in the lake level is due very much to water entering the lake from Dutch Creek. And in the bottom right, I'm not going to go through it in any, any detail, but this is the inflow and outflow from Dutch Creek. And it shows that starting in January and going through December, the flow peaks in the middle of the year in kind of June and then goes back down. We also know that groundwater is very important to the lake. It provides a year-round source of water and that helps maintain a healthy water temperature, lake levels, uh, it offsets evaporation. It also probably helps with um, water quality. We haven't really quantified that yet, but we know that it's probably significant to the water quality of the lake. One of the most important things we realized, and we kind of knew it before, but there is not an unlimited supply of water to meet future demands. Uh, Columbia Lake is a shallow lake, it's a pretty sensitive lake, and we'll have to be very aware of how much water is being taken from it or if there's changes in the water quantity um, that may, may happen if we put too much demands on it. We also know that data are important. We ha now have a database as we do with water quality with five years worth of data and that has helped us establish a baseline. That baseline is available for the Columbia Lake Management Plan which is currently being reworked at this point. It wasn't available for both water quality and water quantity in 1997. We're very happy to make that data available to the people that are making the decisions about the Columbia Lake Management Plan. We also do a lot of education work. Uh, we have developed uh, and delivered twice a water, three times, sorry, a watershed education program for middle school children in the valley, and it includes a classroom and a field trip. There's a picture in the upper right of kids out learning more about their watershed. We do an annual lake tours. We did two. We should have done a third this year, but of course, because of COVID, we did not. And during that lake uh, tour, we call in experts. There's a photo here of two representatives of the Tanaha First Nation talking about how important Columbia Lake is to them. Below that, there's a picture of um, Sue uh, going through 
uh, the wetlands and the importance of the biology and the wetlands to the area. And then in the far left is Colin Cartwright, and he's talking about the headwaters of the Columbia River, which, by the way, is the headwaters of the Columbia of the headwaters of Columbia Lake, which is the headwaters of the Columbia River. And he's talking about its importance to the local community, and also giving us some great story and lore about Columbia Lake. In the middle, there's um, a picture from one of our boat tours, and this is a picture of Tracy Flynn showing one of our very young lakeside residents how to use one of our water quality pieces of equipment. We try to educate the public about issues that could affect the lake of the health, uh, to um, understand more about inv invasive species, and also more about responsible boating. In terms of outreach, we try to do a lot of outreach and advocacy and communication. Uh, we engage the community members. Uh, we do shoreline cleanups, and as a, in the bottom of this slide, there is a picture of some very tired people with a whole bunch of garbage bags around them. Those garbage bags are full of invasive species that had been pulled. Uh, we also help with uh, bird counts. This year, we're getting very involved with the, the uh, Rachel Darbell's work on swallow counts on the lake, and, and they, she's found she's surprised at the number of, of um, colonies that they found, which is very exciting. Uh, we also have developed and uh, get a signage printed for brochures and also around the lake. In the upper right-hand corner, there's a picture of our fish brochure, which our, our fish sign, which outlines all the types of some of the types of fish that are in the lake. Um, we also respond to applications, which means that if somebody puts in an application for change of usage of the land or the foreshore around the lake, we read it and we ask questions about it and make sure that the decision makers have had questions asked to them about how could this impact the lake. Uh, we share resources and expertise with other groups. In the bottom left is a, pic a picture of a young woman from BC uh, government taking a Village sample, which is a biological sample, and we provide our expertise to them. They share our information with us, and we share it back uh, in different forms. We also uh, help with the installation and maintenance. In the bottom right-hand corner, there's a porta potty and a, a set of garbage cans, which is near the place where people take their boats out along the Columbia River, just north of Columbia Lake, and that helps keep the whole area clean. We also have a place there to put our brochures and offer information about the lake. And we, we participate in communi community events. Here's a picture, um, the one in the middle. You can probably pick it out. Uh, with Tracy and one of our former summer students dressed up. Uh, they're doing a duct tape um, boat race at Canal Flats at Canal Days. Um, our boat sank. We certainly did not win, but I think we won for best costume that year. I'd like to finish up by saying, um, although we get funding from a whole bunch of places, our major funding comes from the Columbia Valley Local Conservation Fund. We're able to take that funding and use a, a very dedicated group of volunteers to do a whole much, a bunch and take funding from other places and get a whole bunch done for really not a lot of money. And we really appreciate the Columbia Valley Local Conservation Fund giving us the opportunity to do that. There's a few questions um, about Luxor Lakeage. Um, when, when you look at the long term, um, when do you think the restoration of, of Luxor would be finished? Um, uh, yeah, I don't have, there's no exact date and date in mind, but given what we've done and what we have to do, you know, it could be another 10 years or so, like that's just an estimate. Um, it's pretty variable on the landscape in terms of of how densely overgrown the forests are. So some areas will be faster and some will be slower. So we're definitely hoping to just keep chipping away over the years and be and be finished, you know, within within a few years. Okay. And um, another question is, um, Marlene is wondering uh, if a full species at risk inventory of the property has been undertaken. Um, and if there are some <clears throat> species that flammulated owl or um, great blue heron that have different habitat requirements um, for successful breeding, and if you could just talk more about um, how you guys are approaching your uh, species at risk inventory. Um, we've, we have had some surveys done from biologists with the, the CDC, um, but nothing nothing that covers the entire property in any sort of rigorous way. Um, we do a lot of our own monitoring just with wildlife cameras and like there was a picture of a grizzly bear there that was one of our wildlife cameras that picked that up. Um, so really for us mostly we're looking for sort of incidental sightings um, 
just from us being out on the property. And we, of course, know what species we would expect to see there. Um, like flammulated owl does show up sort of in the data for the region. Um, and also Lewis's woodpecker, but to my knowledge, those haven't actually been found on the property yet. So, so really, uh, I think larger species at risk surveys would be an amazing thing to do um, going forward, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's such a rich area. Um, and so last one, um, while you're still in the hot seat, um, what are you doing, uh, you and the Nature Conservancy and your contractors doing to avoid spreading invasive species while you do um, this kind of restoration work? Um, yeah, invasive species are always top of mind for us. Um, we do work with, in the East Kootenai, we work with the East Kootenai Invasive Species Council um, and to do control efforts on the property. So the main ones, species that we sort of have there are um, leafy spurge and spotted knackweed. Um, so right now they're mostly concentrated on the old road beds on the property. So we really try and make sure that no equipment or machinery leaves the road beds, um, spreading, potentially spreading seeds into the rest of the forest. And um, you know we have clean equipment protocols that we try and get the contractors to adhere to. And we also do all of this work in the winter time. Um, so that really limits the amount of ground disturbance that happens. Um, so we, we don't create as much bare soil that seeds could potentially spread and take hold. Okay, great. Thank you, Kate. Um, I've got a question for Brenda now. Brenda, can you describe a bit about what winter beaver caches look like and how they function? Okay. So beaver caches are their winter food supply, and what they consist of is sticks and branches with fresh bark on of various sizes that they work at building, often starting midsummer. And they build them, they, they do it by sticking the branches and sticks in, deep in the mud at the bottom of the pond so they don't float up. So they make that kind of structure first, and then from thereafter they just keep bringing in more and more and more sticks and branches and sticking them in there so they never float up to the top it seems until they're done and they're always near the den entrance very close so they can swim out of their bank den or their lodge their stick bank den whatever type and stay underwater and go to their food cache and bring food back up into their den chamber to eat so this what they look like is they're very quite obvious because they're fresh branches, and there are usually clues all the way all around with drag marks coming to them and that sort of thing, and often bits of chewed sticks around. They're they're a different color from anything else you see along the channel. Is that helpful? Yeah, that was great. Brenda, I have one for you. I'm wondering if you're going to be using um, wildlife cameras and um, you know, how, uh, how that sort of surveying is going to see um, active beavers. Um, just regards to my showing that in the slide, I, I actually hadn't budgeted for that in this particular project, though I can see that if there was a need for any reason, I don't know whether there really is a need to count the number of individuals, that cameras would probably help. So, well, cameras might just be an add-on you know, once colonies locations were discovered if we wanted to get a better idea of how many individuals were in each colony cameras might be one way to do it but i actually think that um just surveying colony numbers is, is quick relatively quick and efficient and can be compared from year to year so it's it's probably best just to stick with colonies and not worry about too much about cameras except out of further interest down the road i guess that's all Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yep. There's one here that I'd, I'd like to ask um, Aaron. Uh, Aaron, someone's wondering what kind of public relations um, you do to get people to um, learn about and accept the use of um, mycophate as an herbicide for uh, knotweed. 
And that's a great question. And actually, with respect to this program in particular, um, there won't be any glyphosate used. Um, the RDCK board has some concerns about the use of glyphosate in general. And so they've requested that um, glyphosate not be utilized in programs that are funded by them at this point. So we don't anticipate requiring any PR to get people to accept the use of glyphosate. Um, and generally speaking, if you would like more information, because it is actually a very important tool in the toolbox for knotweed treatments, um, I would be happy to expand more on that, either offline or here if we have time. Okay, thanks. Um, I just want to thank the presenters so much for the excellent talks today. Um, and I hope everyone enjoyed the presentations and tour around the great uh, work that's happening in our region. And uh, if you have project ideas that are in the Columbia Valley or Columbia Lake Local Conservation Fund area, I include you to contact uh, Juliet, who's a KCP's program manager to discuss your idea. Applications for both funds will, will open in early September and close October 30th. And uh, we will send out a follow-up email with the link to, uh, to the recording of this webinar and uh, any other materials that um, the speakers want to share with you all uh, as a follow-up. So thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>